Why does Rachel weep? Now, you may be thinking, what a strange question. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 2, 16. Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. We'll look at a couple verses, and I will explain the question that we're trying to answer. So we'll begin in Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. So what's going on in this passage? Well, obviously what what has happened is the wise men did not return to Herod to inform him of the birthplace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Herod realized he was mocked. He was exceedingly wroth. In other words, he was very, very angry. And he gave the order to slew, to slay, to kill all of the children in Bethlehem from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. In other words, he wasn't sure where the Lord Jesus Christ was. So just to be safe, you know, not really safe, but just to make sure that he killed him, he slew all of the infants who were two years old and under. And so then verse 17 says that this is the fulfillment of a prophecy by Jeremiah the prophet. It says Jeremy, it's a reference to Jeremiah. And then it says this in verse 18, and this is the source of our question. In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. Now it's sort of obvious what's going on at one level. There's the slaughter of all these infants, so Rachel weeps, and why wouldn't she? But the thing about it is there's a couple things about this that are very curious. The first question is this, why is it Rachel is the one who is weeping? And the the reason why that's a curious question is that the infants in Bethlehem are primarily not her descendants, and we'll, we'll take a look at that. And then question two, why is Rachel weeping in Ramah? The slaughter obviously takes place in Bethlehem, so why is she weeping in Ramah? So you can see that there's a couple things about this that are a little bit confusing or unclear. So how do we start to study this issue? Well, the first thing to do, you can see Matthew 2, 17 says, Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet. So this is reference to the fact that this is a prophecy. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to find the Old Testament passage that contains this prophecy. So turn with me, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15. Jeremiah 31, verse 15. Now I'm going to take you right to the relevant passage in in Jeremiah 31, but let's say that you weren't sure where it was. How would you figure it out? Well, obviously what you would do is you would go to our friend Blue Letter Bible or another Bible search program, and you would run words like Rachel or children or weeping, things like that. Now keep in mind that when you do that, Rachel might be spelled differently because the Bible often uses different spellings of names and instead of weeping, it might have a synonym. So you might have to do some searching to find it. <clears throat> but if you, if you were to do that, you would come across Jeremiah 31, verse 15. Jeremiah 31, verse 15. Thus saith the Lord, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rahel, you can see there that her name is spelled differently. That's why... You have to sometimes run multiple searches to find what you're looking for. 
Rahel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. And so if you take the time to read Jeremiah 31, uh, the verses before and the verses after, there's nothing in in Jeremiah 31 that I can tell that helps resolve these questions. And so we're going to have to keep digging. So let's start with what I'll call question one. Question one is this. Why is it Rachel is the one who is weeping? The infants of Bethlehem are not her children. So let's let's study this. Get Micah chapter 5, verse 2. <clears throat> Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Now, if you're thinking of the prophecies of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is a verse that might be familiar to you. Let's read it, Micah 5, verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little, notice this, among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Now that's a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ being born in Bethlehem, as we all understand. But what I want to notice in that verse for for our purposes is this. Bethlehem is little among the thousands of Judah. And what that refers to is this. The city of Bethlehem was located in the area that was given as the inheritance for the tribe of Judah. In other words, when the 12 tribes came into the promised land, what God did is he divided the promised land and he gave different areas to different tribes. Bethlehem is in the area that is given to the tribe of Judah. Get Matthew chapter 2, verse 6. Matthew chapter 2, verse 6. Now, one of the things that I like to do, this is something I would recommend, Scripture says multiple times, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And the idea is it's always good to do something on the basis of not one witness, but two or three witnesses. So as you're thinking about any particular doctrine or any particular biblical fact, it is a good idea to find multiple verses. And if you find multiple verses that say the same thing, you can feel fairly confident that you've understood the point that's being made. So look with me at Matthew chapter 2, verse 6. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah. Now, Judah is spelled differently there. It's spelled J-U-D-A. It doesn't have the H, but it is a reference to the same tribe. It's not a reference to a different tribe. So what we can see, we're fairly confident. There's other verses we could look at, but we can tell from Micah and Matthew that Bethlehem, that city, is located in the land of Judah. Now, what some people like to do is they like to uh, do a shortcut. And so let me give you an example. What you can do here is you can pick up a map and you can look at the map and you can see Bethlehem is right there and it's in the tribe of Judah. I don't like to do things that way. I'm I'm sort of, it's much better, it seems to me, you know, by the way, this is a map. A man made the map. So are the specific details here all perfect? Maybe, maybe not, probably not. You, you, you can have much more confidence. You can have much more certainty if you find a verse. So based upon the verses we've seen, we have reason to think that Bethlehem is located in Judah. Okay, so what? Bethlehem is in Judah. Well, get with me Genesis 35, verse 23. Genesis 35, verse 23. Genesis 35 and verse 23. The sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, and Levi, and Judah, and Issachar, and Zebulun. So Genesis 35, 23, the tribe of Judah is descended from who? It's descended from Leah. It's not descended from Rachel. 
Now, you probably remember this, but if you think about Jacob and Jacob, Jacob worked for Laban for the purpose of securing Rachel's hand in marriage, but he was also given Leah. And when you read about the events in Genesis, you know that between Leah and Rachel, there is a rivalry, and Leah has sons and Rachel doesn't. There's a whole bunch of back and forth. But the thing I want you to notice is these verses present the issue. What Matthew 2.18 says in Rama was there a voice heard lamentation and weeping, and it's Rachel that's doing the weeping. But Rachel's doing the weeping, and the slaughter occurs in Bethlehem, and Bethlehem belongs to the tribe of Judah. Judah is not descended from Rachel. It's descended from Leah. So what's going on? Well, go back with me to Matthew 2, verse 16. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. Let's read it again. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth, and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, notice, and in all the coasts thereof. So Herod clearly slew the children that were in Bethlehem, but what else did he do? Well, the region was a little bit broader than that, wasn't it? It's not just Bethlehem. It's Bethlehem and all the coasts thereof. So let's understand what that means. Now, if we want to understand what it means by all the coasts thereof, what we need to do is we're going to need to run some verses about how does the Bible use the word coast. And let's just go ahead and, and skip to the one of the interesting verses. Get Numbers chapter 32, verse 33. Numbers 32, verse 33. And Moses gave unto them, even to the children of Gad, and to the children of Reuben, and unto half the tribe of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, the kingdom of Sihon, king of the Amorites, and the kingdom of Og, king of Bashan. Now notice this next part. The land with the cities thereof in the coasts, even the cities of the country round about. The word even is often used in the scripture to mean equal, or in other words. The land with the cities thereof in the coasts, and, and how's it going to define the cities thereof in the coasts? Even the cities of the country round about. In other words, what that's telling you is that the term coast can include the surrounding area. That's the idea. So when you think of Bethlehem and its coast, it's really talking about Bethlehem, but then also what else? The area around it. That's what Matthew 2.16 says when it talks about coasts, and we understand from Numbers 32 what... Uh, we understand from Numbers 32 what the term coast means. Now, a, a, a next question that I want to take up is, is this. Where is Rachel buried? And what's commonly thought is that Rachel is buried in Ramah. And people generally think that because of Matthew 2.18 and Jeremiah 31.15, which talks about in Ramah, there's, there's weeping, and people think, well, that, that must be where Rachel is buried. Get with me Genesis 35. <clears throat> Genesis <clears throat> chapter 35, and we'll look at verse 16, Genesis 35.16. Genesis 35, 16, and they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath, and Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. So there's a journey that's taking place in Genesis 35, 16, and it is a journey from Bethel to Ephrath. Look at verse 19, Genesis 35, Verse 19. 
And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. Okay, so what does that tell us? Well, verse 16, there's the start of a journey, and it goes from Bethel, and, and Bethel is uh, in the north. And uh, it's not on this map, but I'll show it to you. On uh, It's actually right there. It's from Bethlehem to Ephrath. And what happens is, as they're making the journey, it's a southward journey. It's going from Bethel down to Bethlehem. Rachel dies in the way. And so what people often think is they think she died at, at Ramah. But look with me at Genesis 48, verse 7. Genesis chapter 48 and verse 7. Genesis 48, 7. And as for me, when I came from Paden, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way, when yet there was but a little way to come unto Ephrath. And I buried there in the way of Ephrath, the same is Bethlehem. Now Genesis 48, verse 7, gives us some additional information. She died, and we, we already knew it was between Bethel and Bethlehem, but now what we learn from Genesis 48, verse 7, it's when yet there was but a little way to come unto Ephrath. So did she die at the beginning of the journey, or did she die near the end of the journey? Well, she died near the end of the journey when there was just but a little way to come unto Ephrath. And so I'm going to show you a slide here, and I think this slide is helpful. So up here is, is Bethel, and down here is Bethlehem, or Ephrath. And so you can see the journey there. So you can see however long that is. And what we're told is that she died when there was but a little way to Ephrath, which we, we know to be Bethlehem. So did she die up here? Well, she couldn't have died up here. Well, could she have died in Ramah? Well, Ramah's not, a, there's not but a little bit, right? You can see there's obviously much further to go. So on the authority of Genesis 48, verse 7, it doesn't seem that Rachel would have been buried in, in, in Ramah. So let's keep reading, and let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 1. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him, and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? Now this is Samuel, and he is anointing Saul there, if I'm not mistaken. Verse 2, When thou art departed from me today, then thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulcher. Aha! Now we're getting somewhere. Two men by Rachel's sepulcher, sepulcher in the border of Benjamin at Zelzah. And they will say unto thee, The asses which thou wentest to seek are found, and lo, thy father hath left the care of the asses, and sorroweth for you, saying, What shall I do for my son? Well, we found the answer. And the answer is, where is Rachel's sepulcher? Well, that's obviously where she's buried, and it is at Zelzah. So if we look at our map again, here is where, at least in this map's idea, that's where Zelza is located, and it labels it as Rachel's tomb. And you, you notice that it is but a little way to Bethlehem. So that all seems to fit together nicely. And it makes sense because if the journey is from Bethel to Bethlehem, and we're confident of where those two cities are, and if Rachel dies but a little way, from Bethlehem, then she has to die somewhere along, you know, in this area right here. So it makes sense that Zelza would be there. But notice that we've learned something else from this verse. And, and, and it's, it's amazing how the Word of God just has little clues and, and secrets and, and, and gems of wisdom if we just pay attention. Now notice what this says. By Rachel's sepulcher, 
And then notice what it says, in the border of Benjamin. So Rachel's sepulcher is located where? Well, it, it's located in Zelza, but that's near the border of Benjamin. Now, if you look at, at this map, you can see this red outline here that is drawn. Judah, well, let's talk about Bethlehem Ephrath. Bethlehem Ephrath is located in whose inheritance? It's located in Judah's. We saw that in Micah 5, verse 2. We saw that in Matthew 2. So Bethlehem is in Judah. And we know that where Rachel dies is but a little bit away. And her sepulcher, sepulcher, even though it's only a little bit away, is it located in Judah? It's not located in Judah. It's located in Benjamin. What that's telling you is that where Bethlehem is located, it is right near the edge of Judah, and it's very close to Benjamin. Well, what do we know about Benjamin? Well, look with me at Genesis 35, verse 24. Genesis 35, and we will look at verse 24. The sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin. So, the the region that Benjamin occupies, are those properly the descendants of Rachel? And the answer is yes, because Rachel's son is Benjamin. So now if we put this all together, if... (coughs) If Rachel, if Jacob and Rachel are traveling from Bethel down to Bethlehem and they're making this journey, well, obviously they're traveling through the area that belongs to Benjamin. And if Rachel dies but a little way from Bethlehem and her sepulcher is in Zelza, and Zelza is specifically said to be in the border of Benjamin, well, then Zelza is right along the border of between Benjamin and Bethlehem. So now think through this just for a minute. When Herod was very wroth, when he was very angry, he slew all the infants in Bethlehem as well as where else? In the coast thereof. So apparently what happened is, Not only were infants slain in Bethlehem, but the surrounding area, and it went from not only the area in Judah around Bethlehem, but it went all the way into Benjamin and included land within the inheritance given to Benjamin. And if that's the case, doesn't it make sense then that Rachel would weep for her children? Because the tribe of Benjamin are all her descendants. So when you put it all together, it seems to make sense. The reason Rachel is the one who's weeping is she's buried in Zelza, which is on the border of Benjamin. She was buried but a little way from Bethlehem. And it's obvious that Bethlehem is located in Judah, but near where Benjamin is. And so when Herod gave the order, it, it, it ended up in the destruction of infants, not only in Judah, but also in Benjamin. So that's fascinating, isn't it? So when Scripture tells you that, that Rachel is weeping, what it seems to communicate is that the slaughter was in an area so wide that it was not simply Bethlehem, but it was a, a wide enough area that it extended all the way into the the tribe of Benjamin. So that that explains why Rachel is weeping, because it's, it's her descendants. Her descendants are included in the slaughter. They're not the only ones in the slaughter, but her her descendants are included. But now that leads us to the next question. And that question is, why is Rachel weeping in Ramah? Because the slaughter takes place in Benjamin. And she's not buried in in Ramah. What what many commentators say is they'll say, well, Rachel was buried in Ramah, and that's why it says in Ramah she was weeping. 
But we just saw she's not buried in Rama, she's buried in Zelza. So that's really not the answer. So why does it say that she's weeping in Rama? Get Joshua 18, verse 21. Joshua 18, verse 21. We're going to read several verses in Joshua 18. Joshua 18, verse 21. Now the cities of the tribe of the children of Benjamin. So what verse 21 and the following verses are going to do is it's going to list for us some of the cities that exist within the tribe of Benjamin's inheritance. Now the cities of the tribe of the children of Benjamin, according to their families, were Jericho and Beth Hogla and the valley of Kaziz and Beth Araba. And let's go ahead and just for time, we'll go down to verse 25. Gibeon and Ramah and Beeroth. Go to verse 28. And Zela, Eliph, and Jeb- Jebusai, which is Jerusalem, Gibeoth and Kirjath, 14 cities with their villages. This is the inheritance of the children of Benjamin according to their families. So what we see is Ramah is clearly located within the inheritance given to the children of Benjamin. Now, just to show you how most maps depict this, Ramah is pictured in the north. In other words, it is pictured south of Bethel. They're putting it right here. It's south of Bethel but it is north of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is north of Bethlehem. So in other words, if we start at the top, we go to the bottom. There's Bethel, there's Ramah, that is Jebus, which is it's Jerusalem, same thing. See how it talked about Jebusai in that verse. And then down here is, is Bethlehem. So look with me at Matthew chapter 2, verse 3. Matthew chapter 2, verse 3. And while you're getting that, I'll make one other point. Uh, according to uh, the, the information that I have seen, Rama is approximately 11 miles north of, of, of 11 miles north of Bethlehem, and Jerusalem is six miles north of Bethlehem. So in other words, it's six miles to there and then five miles to there. That's the rough distances uh, between them. Matthew 2, verse 3. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 3. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. So when... Herod commands the slaughter of the infants. What I want, just want you to notice is that he is sitting in, in Jerusalem, it seems. That was where his, his base was. Now, think about that just for a minute. If So right here is Jerusalem. That's where Herod is. When he commands the, the slaughter of the infants, it's, it's Bethlehem is right here, Zelza is here, So it's this area right here that is impacted. It doesn't seem to go as far north as Jerusalem, at least not that we're told. So would the slaughter down here affect Ramah up here? You wouldn't think so because the slaughter doesn't even get as far north as Jerusalem. So what's going on there? In other words, it doesn't appear that there are infants slaughtered in Ramah. It seems they're slaughtered farther south. So let's do this. Go back with me to Jeremiah 31, verse 15. Jeremiah 31, verse 15. Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rahel weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. And so what we should do at this point is we should investigate the city of Ramah a little bit further. And so let's run a search to do just that. 
So what we're going to do here to try to understand what's going on in, in the book of Jeremiah is we're going to run a search for Rhema, and then we're going to do this ad little advanced options here. So if you notice, I typed in my search term there, and I clicked advanced options. And now what it allows me to do is I can select either a predefined list or I can pick my own range or I can create a custom selection as to the books I want to search. Well, what I'm going to do for this is I'm going to pick Jeremiah. And the reason I'm going to pick Jeremiah is the following. What we want to do is we want to understand the context of Jeremiah 31, verse 15, when it's talking about Ramah. So to do that, we would read the verses before, we'd read the verses after, we'd get the context. But one of the things we should do is we should understand what else does the book of Jeremiah tell us about the city of Ramah. So I have my search here. I've, I've, I've set the, the range, and I have the word Ramah. So now I'm going to hit return and see what we get. Okay, so we've got two verses here. We've got Jeremiah 31, verse 15, which we already read. But we also now have Jeremiah 40, verse 1. So let's look at that. So Jeremiah chapter 40 and verse 1. Jeremiah 40, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. After that, Nebuzaradan, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard had let him go from Ramah. So Jeremiah was released at Ramah. That's interesting because, of course, when we're in Matthew 2 and it's talking about the, prophet, the, the prophecy of Jeremiah, the, Jeremy the prophet, and then it says in Ramah. After that, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had let him go from Ramah when he had taken him being bound in chains among all that were carried away captive of Jerusalem and Judah, which were carried away captive unto Babylon. So what is that verse telling us? Well, we know that what happens during Jeremiah's ministry is that Judah, the southern kingdom, is conquered by Babylon. Jerusalem is conquered, destroyed, and the children of Judah are carried away captive into Babylon. Now let's just sp spend a few moments on, on what this verse specifically says. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, after that the captain of the guard had let him go from Ramah. So the captain of the guard let him go. Obviously, he was bound. In other words, he was captive, but he was then released. Now, notice the next section. When he had taken him, being bound in chains, so Jeremiah was bound, among all that were carried away captive of Jerusalem and Judah. Well, what that means is that the whole group of people, of the children of Israel, they were carried away captive, but it's at Ramah that Jeremiah was released. So what seems to be the case is that the children of Israel are taken captive by the Babylonians, and they're transported to Ramah. In other words, when you think about, when you think about the, the, the map just for a minute, So when we're thinking of the southern kingdom, as you recall, when, when Israel is split into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, the southern kingdom consists of two tribes. Those tribes are Benjamin and Judah. So it's Benjamin, this area right here, and it's Judah right here. So what we're looking at here, and Judah extends a little farther south. Judah is bigger than this. It's farther south. But this group right here, this, this region is what is conquered by the Babylonians. And therefore, what happens is the, the children of Israel are carried away in chains to Ramah before they are carried into Babylon. 
And that is where Jeremiah is released. Now, if you put all that together and you think about what's being said in Jeremiah 31, it makes sense that Rachel would weep would weep in Rama since number one, Rama is part of Benjamin, which is her descendant, and that is the point from which her children were carried away captive. What happens often with prophecy is that prophecy has a near fulfillment and then it has a far fulfillment. And what we see here is this prophecy in Jeremiah 31 of Rachel weeping in Ramah makes sense because are her children going to be taken captive and then transported into Babylon? Yes. And so there is a near fulfillment of Jeremiah 31 in Jeremiah 40. But not only is there a near fulfillment, there is a far fulfillment in Matthew 2, where Rachel would refuse to be comforted over her children because her children were not. So what seems to be going on with Jeremiah 31 is that there is both a near fulfillment in Jeremiah 40 and a far fulfillment in Matthew chapter 2. Now you may then ask this question, well, why does it say in Ramah in Matthew chapter 2? Because in Matthew chapter 2, well, Rachel's not buried in Ramah, so that doesn't make sense. The slaughter doesn't appear to be in Ramah. It appears to be down here. So, so why does it say that exactly? Well, the, the, the near fulfillment in this case was easy because Jeremiah 40 was, was pretty clear that the children of Judah were brought to Ramah in captivity. The far fulfillment is a harder question, and I'm going to leave that for further study that you can, you can look at. But I do want to show you uh, one study technique that you should uh, take advantage of. So let's go back to our verses here on Ramah just for a second. Computer's thinking very carefully. It wants to make sure it gives me the right information and not a wrong answer. So I appreciate it thinking so carefully. And uh, of course, you, you, know, you know the way that technology works, right? So what happens is it, it never does what you want it to do. It's always sort of misbehaving and ornery. Here we go. So it just wanted me to open a new window. So let's look up the word Rama, and I want to show you a study technique that may be helpful to you. So what I'm going to show you here is I'm going to show you the little box that says Strong's. And what Strong's is, is it's a reference to the Strong's Concordance. So if I click here on Strong's, notice what it does. What it does is after each of the, the relevant English words, it gives me a little hyperlink. So after the word Rhema, it gives me this hyperlink right here. And if I click on that, it's going to give me the Hebrew word. So I'm just going to click on that right there. And now what we can see is the Hebrew word that underlines, that, that is behind the word rhema in English. Now this is a good thing to know as, as a study technique. Not that you go to the Hebrew and the Greek to change what the English says. That would be a fool's errand. You don't want to do that. But it may help you understand what the word means. Now what I want you to notice here as we look at this is it's going to tell us some things about the word rhema. So let's just look at this together. So rhema means hill, and then you can see there's an A, B, C, D, E, and F. There are different rhemas in the scriptures, and if you study the word rhema, you will see this to be the case. So, for example, the first meaning here is a town in Bethlehem on the border of Ephraim, about five miles from Jerusalem and near to Gibeah. That's the one that we've already looked at. B, the home place of Samuel lo located in the hill country of Ephraim. C, a fortified city in Naphtali. Now I'm going to take the time to just demonstrate this here. Get with me, if you would, Joshua 19, verse 32. Joshua 19, 
verse 32. Joshua 19 and verse 32. The sixth lot came out to the children of Naphtali, even for the children of Naphtali according to their families. And their coast was from Heleph, from Allen, and so on. Go down to verse 35. And the fenced cities are Zidim, Zur, and Hamath, Rakath, and Chinnereth. Verse 36. And Adama, and what's the next word? Rama. Well, we saw earlier, if you recall, you can just rewind the video a few seconds, but we saw that Rama was included in the inheritance given to Benjamin. So what gives? Did God give the same area to two different tribes? Or are there simply different cities that have the same name? Well, we have that, obviously, right? There's all kinds of examples you can think of where there is different cities, different locations, but the city has the same name. There is more than one Columbus in the United States, for example. There's a Columbus in the state of Ohio, and there are, there's cities named Columbus in other states. So as you study this further, one of the things that you may want to do is you may want to look at all the ramas in Scripture because there are different ones. Well, we hope that this helps you understand a little bit about why was Rachel weeping. Uh, and there's some, some things here that you can search out further to be fully persuaded of in your own mind. I'll simply close with, with this observation. One of the fascinating things that God does is when he gives you a verse, and the verse on its surface seems confusing. For example, why is Rachel weeping for the destruction of people that aren't her descendants? That, that just seems strange. Well, when you study it out, you invariably learn new things. God is telling you something. One of the things we learn is that Herod's wicked edict was such that it not only affected the infants in Bethlehem, but the infants in the coast thereof, even to a, a separate region that was occupied by the tribe of Benjamin.